Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. There is only one woman who stands above all of them as an inspiration, not just for me, but for all womankind. She has always been very, very clear that above all, ours is an industry of show business. And with that clarity, she has played the game better than any of the rest of them. 13 years ago, when the word AIDS was barely whispered, and before our government leaders dared to address the problem, Elizabeth Taylor got mad. Her light continues to shine in a much more wondrous fashion. And so tonight we honor you, Elizabeth, for your courage, for your strength, for your convictions, for your compassion, but most of all, for your inspiration. By sharing your light, you have unconsciously given us permission to do the same. You are the most golden of stars. Happy birthday. Whoopi, Shirley, Cher, Madonna, the biggest woman influencers of their eras made it clear who first wrote the playbook, captured the light, and shined the way for all who followed in her footsteps. Along with some fantastic men, they gathered out of love and respect to celebrate Elizabeth Taylor on her 65th birthday. It was a televised event that Elizabeth agreed to do on the condition that the event be used to raise funds for the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. Yet again, Elizabeth was showing everyone how it's done, how to leverage one's celebrity, the media, and the press to create meaningful change in the world. And she used an event that celebrated her longevity to do it. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank you. I want to thank you all for being here, for supporting me, for allowing me to be with my family on this, my birthday, which I'm not here to celebrate. I'm here to celebrate all the people in the world with AIDS. And this function has enabled us, because of you and your generosity and your big hearts, It's enabled ETAF to go places all over the world. And because of you, they will be touched, they will be fed, they will be nurtured with your love. And I thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you and God bless. By the time of this event, Elizabeth had been working for 56 years, over half a century. When one adds in her tragedies and triumphs, her impact on art, culture, and advocacy, and her business empire, hers was a life well-lived by any measure. And in this moment, Elizabeth's personal journey was on the precipice of yet another test of her mortality. As she sat through her televised 65th birthday celebration, packed with family, friends, and influencers, Elizabeth had a terrifying secret. There was a tumor in her brain that required immediate surgery. 
she had learned of it only days before. And yet here she was, sitting through the evening with cameras trained on her every move, knowing that this might be the last moment a global audience would set their eyes on her, that it might be the final hours of her extraordinary life. Elizabeth was here because she had given her word, because it was a professional commitment, and others had organized their own lives to be there for her, because it might be her last living chance to use her platform for the war on HIV AIDS. No matter how commercialized and transactional the term has become, Elizabeth Taylor was an influencer, the original, in the purest and most powerful meaning of the word. And that meant she would be in that chair on that evening, making a difference with her life up to the very last second she still had one. I'm Katy Perry, and this is Elizabeth I. It's super hard to shop for the Elizabeth Taylor in your life. You know, someone with such spectacular taste and impeccable style that nothing seems good enough. I think that's how Lisa feels when she tries to buy something for me. Just kidding, mom. Maybe they're the hostess with the hottest invite in town, or maybe they're the most stylish person you know. When you're not sure what holiday gift to get them, head to Rakuten. You'll find something for everyone on your list, and you'll get cash back. Rakuten helps you get the most savings plus cash back at thousands of stores like Bloomingdale's, Apple, Sephora, and Target. With the cash back you earn, you'll have everyone on your list saying, wow, I cannot believe you got me this. So get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. This is Chapter 8, Battle Scars. I'm a bit awestruck to look back on Elizabeth's 65th birthday event and see the names and voices who gathered to enthusiastically celebrate her life. The world's most famous men had always surrounded Elizabeth, from James Dean to Paul Newman to presidents to Michael Jackson. The men were always there, many of them becoming famous simply by orbiting her son. But women were too. Just look at the four voices that launched us into this episode. No names were bigger, and they loved her, genuinely, because Elizabeth loved them back, especially in a way that we often need it the most. Elizabeth loved empowering women. She led by example, she opened doors, and for the women closest to her, Elizabeth was a champion. Elizabeth's attorney, trustee, and friend, Barbara Berkowitz, shares with us the experience of having Elizabeth as your champion. While Barbara was working as hard as she could for her client, including closing the deal on the televised 65th birthday event. It all came to a head right before her 65th birthday special. And I was in charge of handling Elizabeth primarily. She liked working with me. The birthday special was going to be on ABC. And so I said, where's the paperwork to the senior partner? And he says, there is no paperwork. And I question that because what television show goes on air that's unpapered? And nothing, nothing, nothing. There was no paperwork coming. I find out that he's trying to impress a young associate. So he has her going to all the meetings and who knows nothing. She's pretty, but knows nothing. And it turns out that ABC had wanted, had prepared paperwork. The senior partner signed it under her power of attorney, under Elizabeth's power of attorney without her, her knowledge. And ABC had refused to, to accept the power of attorney because they wanted Elizabeth there. They wanted the guarantee that if Elizabeth signed it, she was going to show up. And he kept refusing to have her sign it. So ABC called the producers and said, if Elizabeth doesn't sign it within 48 hours, we are pulling the plug. This was around Christmas time, and so this team of people were going to have to shut down and, and, and fire everybody. So she gets a call from ABC saying, why won't you sign the paperwork? And she's like, I don't know anything about this. So, of course, she called me, and I didn't know anything about it. So Elizabeth calls the senior partner and says, nobody's to work on any of my matters except Barbara. 
which on one hand was fabulous. On the other hand, I can still hear him screaming over the firm intercom to get my ass down to his office. And he says to me, who the fuck does Elizabeth Taylor think she is that she is going to dictate, you know, who is going to work on her, her cases? Go, I don't know what she thinks you can do. So we had a couple choices. I could look at the contract and tell her to sign it as, as is, tell her to walk away, or I could try and tweak a few things. So I tried to tweak a few things. It was not the best, but I could only do what I was going to do. And I remember walking into ABC. Their um, offices were by the Schubert going down the hall, and nobody believed that Elizabeth was ever going to sign anything because they'd been trying for months to get her to sign anything. I said, if she tells me she's going to sign it, she's going to sign it. I went and picked up the paperwork, and I went straight to Elizabeth's house, and she signed the paperwork. You know, she was a very straight shot. If she tells you she's going to do something, she did it with me. And so the producers cried, and I remember the um, executive producer <laughs> He bought himself a new fax machine so that whenever I got that signature, I could fax it to him to prove that the show was going to go on, and it did. It was a scary time because a couple days before, she had been diagnosed with a brain tumor, so we weren't sure if she was really going to be doing the show. I mean, she had a good excuse, but she, she kind of rallied, and she did it. The ABC special wasn't the first time Elizabeth was able to use her influence with the media to fundraise for HIV-AIDS from the media itself. Six years earlier, in 1991, Elizabeth married Larry Fortensky, a man she'd met during her second stay at the Betty Ford Clinic. It was her last marriage, and she was divorced by the time of the ABC special. But in looking back at it, we discover another of Elizabeth's firsts. Elizabeth went to the Betty Ford Center twice. She went in 1983 and she went in 1988. The second time, she met a man named Larry Fortensky. They were in group therapy together. They were going to meetings together. They became friends. That's what happens in rehab. And so when Elizabeth came home, she invited people to stay at her house from treatment. And it was over Christmas. And Larry was part of that. Larry was protective. He could be fun. He was a tough guy. Definitely tough and rough. But I loved him. And Elizabeth loved him, more importantly. Uh, it was nice for Elizabeth to have somebody who was a little bit like a watchdog. You know, she'd been single for a while. She had a good time. But she was ready to settle down again. As Shirley MacLaine would note, Elizabeth had learned to play the showbiz game better than anyone. Her wedding was already set to be a media spectacle, with the ceremony taking place at Neverland Ranch. In a twist of creativity, Elizabeth figured out how to keep her wedding sacred, while leveraging the media's predation of her private life into a win for the battle against HIV-AIDS. These wedding photos were just so sought after. And I believe it was Liz Smith, the columnist, uh, who suggested to Elizabeth that she sell her wedding photos. They were worth a fortune. She made a million dollars off of those wedding photos. And she used that money to start the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. Nancy Reagan came and there was Secret Service at the door, all of Michael's security, all of Elizabeth's security. It was a huge thing. Combine a celebrity of Elizabeth's magnitude, a wedding in a storied location, a former first lady, a royal princess, and a who's who guest list. And not only is the press going to come, they're in a frenzy. I mean, Elizabeth is still the biggest star in the world. And this is like the biggest celebrity wedding. There's a dirt road going up to Neverland that's miles. There were all these, I mean, the news vans were all along that street. They couldn't get in to the wedding, but they had to be there. They had to shoot the gates and to see who was coming in the cars. It's a really big deal, as one can imagine. I mean, it's Neverland Ranch 
It's Elizabeth Taylor marrying Larry Fortensky, who she met at Betty Ford, a construction worker. The world's press descended upon this little town of Los Olivos. I think it had a restaurant and, and a, like a motel and maybe a convenience store. It was tiny. I actually got to go up there with the clothes because the wedding dress was so sought after. I mean, the, the, the press was dying for a leak, an image of the wedding dress. So there was a driver, but it wasn't, we couldn't take a risk. We couldn't take the risk that the driver would take a picture and give it and sell it to the press. So I went up with him to kind of guard that. She had made this deal for a million bucks. That dress could not be photographed. It would ruin everything. Elizabeth really only had two formal weddings, which was her first and her last. It was yellow, but it was a beautiful, traditional wedding gown. And with bridesmaids, which were like some close friends and family members. And the only wedding I went to was uh, Michael Jackson. I mean, with Fortinsky, that's the only wedding I went to. The others, well, I, I am amazing. Listen, I had the best time at all, always. She wanted me to be a bridesmaid. I said, Elizabeth, you're completely ridiculous. You, you an old man getting married, and me an old man being a bridesmaid. I refused. <laughs> it was, it was fantastic. The whole, I mean, I was so impressed to be there. You know, I was happy to be there. It was beautifully organized. I we all stayed in the hotel in the town. You know, it was great fun. The only thing I didn't like, no cameras. I always take photographs and I couldn't take my camera to take photographs. But it was fun. It was great fun. Beautiful. The place is amazing. So there's a rehearsal dinner in this restaurant in this tiny town and there are so many paparazzi. The restaurant was shaking. I mean, the walls were shaking because there were so many paparazzi pushing at the windows. And once the wedding started, there were, I think there were 13 or 14 helicopters because I guess they couldn't control the airspace. They should have been able to because Nancy Reagan was there, but for whatever reason, they weren't able to. So you have all these helicopters. It's a lot. It was so loud. We couldn't hear the wedding. And at one point, a paparazzi jumped out of the helicopter and parachuted down, which, of course, Elizabeth Security jumped right on him. He created an event, and during the wedding. Garnering a million dollars from a press outlet for exclusive photos was another celebrity first. It was all worth it. From the sale of the photographs, Elizabeth's final wedding provided the seed money to help launch the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. While Anthar was still doing important work on the scientific front for HIV AIDS, Elizabeth also wanted to focus directly on the patient, on bringing resources and care to people in need. She was now helming her own foundation, running a fragrance empire, and juggling a new marriage. Elizabeth had always been an independently successful woman heading into her unions, and yet she embraced the role of a supportive partner. It was never either or for Elizabeth. She simply broadened herself to incorporate whomever was coming into her life. She was supportive as Larry's wife, a little different than her other marriages or romantic relationships. Larry was a construction worker, so she got up early. He went to work, and she respected that he still worked. He had to get up, let's say, at 5 in the morning to go to the job, and she would wake up, and she would have breakfast with him, make sure that, I don't think she did it herself, but make sure he had a lunchbox with food for the day, and, you know, and send him off to work. And then Elizabeth went back to sleep, and then she got up, and she ran her business and lived her life. And then he came home, and they were together at the end of the day. It was difficult because people were judgmental, and the kind of people in Elizabeth's life weren't so accepting of somebody like Larry, but Elizabeth was, people respected Elizabeth, and she wasn't taking shit from anybody. During this time, another life and death tragedy was unfolding in Elizabeth's world. Her dear friend and publicist, Shen Sam, was dying. Shen had been with Elizabeth 
since her second marriage to Richard Burton. Elizabeth and Richard, when they were married for the second time in Botswana, Richard wasn't feeling well. And there was a pharmacist named Shen Sam who came to their tent. As I understand it, she also did security. But remember, we're in, you know, a very remote part of Africa. So can't think about it in U.S. terms or, or Western terms. She was coming in and, and regularly to, to check on Richard and, and, and help him in whatever way he needed. During that time, Elizabeth and Shen got close. Shen's son had killed himself. He jumped off a cliff and she was in a very vulnerable state. So they bonded and Shen was lost as one would be in her life at that time. And so Elizabeth said to Shen, I'll bring you back with me. I'll find a job for you. But why don't you come back with me and Richard? Well, as we know, that marriage didn't last long. So about a year. And Shen was Elizabeth's assistant, executive assistant. What I was doing for her years later, Roger as well, during her time in D.C. So then she goes and marries Senator Warner, and Shen is with her that whole time. So they're at Studio 54 partying, and, and, and they're with Halston and Liza, and even Betty Ford was there. And Shen is there, and you could see Shen in a lot of photos, and she was a character. Shen was fabulous. She was the best storyteller. She drank like a fish. She was outrageous, but so was Elizabeth. And they became like sisters. When the fragrance deal came around, Shen was part of it. And Shen was brilliant. I mean, she really understood the commodity of Elizabeth Taylor. It made sense because she had worked for Elizabeth all those years. So you, you get it. Shen went on the campaign trail with Elizabeth to get John Warner elected to the Senate. And at one point, Shen had kind of had it. And she decided that she wanted to become a publicist. So Elizabeth said, fine, do what you want. She moved to New York. She trained, became a publicist. And then she, uh, she became Elizabeth's publicist. Elizabeth hired her. So that is in the early 80s. And Shen was very involved in the first AIDS event that Elizabeth not only put her name to, but organized and got involved. And Shen got involved with Elizabeth. And she came to LA. She was living in New York. She came to LA, opened up an office at the Mondrian and worked from there. So they were a team. They were a team. Shen Sam was her publicist and best friend, by the way, sister's best friend, who was responsible for so much that Elizabeth did. It's a shame that she died. It's just a shame. She was a dear friend of mine, too. And I, Shen and I fell in love immediately with each other. Shen worked her butt off to make this thing a success. Shen was committed to AIDS, as Elizabeth was. And then the fragrances came around. Shen organized the fragrance tours. She was a huge character in Elizabeth's life. Shen was a hypochondriac. She was always talking about how she had these terminal illnesses. And finally, she actually got brain cancer. And so she did one more fragrance tour. She went on chemo. She was still Shen. She was great. The last fragrance tour was Black Pearls. And after that, probably six weeks before Shen passed, she came to Elizabeth's home and wrapped up her affairs, but still was, you know, still was trying Elizabeth created this beautiful environment for Shen in her last weeks in a room looking out into the garden, beautiful pool. It was a wonderful view. She, she eventually had a, a hospital bed and Shen died. In the middle of the night, her friend, Elizabeth's friend, Norma Heyman, called me, said, Shen passed, you better come over. So I drove up to, I drove through Sunset Boulevard. I drove on Sunset Boulevard to the house. And I went into the room, and Elizabeth was sitting there alone with Shen's body. And we sat there together. We held hands. It was such a peaceful thing. 
I asked Elizabeth if it bothered her, and she said no. And so we just sat there with Shen, and Elizabeth was calm about it. It was something that she knew in advance. And for somebody who had experienced sudden death, Mike Todd was killed in a plane crash. James Dean was killed in a car crash. You know, Montgomery Cliff didn't die, but he, he, uh, but he was in a car crash. And so when it came to Shen, Elizabeth was able to create a space where it was very beautiful, very compassionate, very loving, and a very peaceful way to say goodbye to a woman who had been her sister, who she'd known for decades. A few months after Shen's death came the end of Elizabeth's last marriage. And a few short months after that came Elizabeth's own diagnosis. All of a sudden, up in my bedroom, I was alone. I could hear myself screaming. I was having a seizure. And they came up to my room looking all terribly doctorish and somber. And they said, Elizabeth, you have a brain tumor. I was stunned. And I said, well, how, how big is it? And they said about two and a half inches, thickness of a golf ball. And I said, well, I don't particularly want that. While we can't all have the lavish lifestyle of a world-famous celebrity, we can treat ourselves to something nice during the holidays. Rakuten is here to help with that. Whether you're buying gifts for others or for yourself, you can get cash back at thousands of stores. We're here to help you save money, find the best deals, and get more bang for every buck. Head to Rakuten and get cash back at stores you love, like Macy's, Aveda, Lancome, Michael Kors, Ray-Ban, and more. With the cash back you earn, you can make your holiday season as lavish as Cleopatra. <laughs> well, almost. Wow your party guests with a perfectly decorated home. Put together a killer party outfit and makeup look. It's all possible with Rakuten. It's like getting paid to shop. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. In the final moments before the surgery, Elizabeth sat down with Life magazine to share her experience. Her granddaughter, Naomi Wilding, reads her account as published by Life magazine in Elizabeth's own words. I just sat there, speechless, in sheer terror, a brain tumor. They wanted to operate on my brain, on my emotions, my thoughts, my memories, my sense of poetry, my feelings for colors, my soul, myself. My brain is my life. Afterward, even if I survived, would I still be me? I decided not to ask how dangerous the operation could be, if I would have brain damage, if I might die. Benign was a nice enough word for me. I let it go at that. But there were things that had to be faced. I had to tell my family. I kept up a brave front, making jokes, guillotine humor. Boy, my head is killing me. And I had to decide what to do about the party. ABC had gone to enormous expense to arrange a broadcast to celebrate my 65th birthday. To be there for the show, I'd have to delay the operation. My surgeon said I could. And yet, I thought, the last thing I want to do right now is go to a birthday party. I can't put my heart into that. Then I thought, to back out is really chicken shit. The party was a fundraiser for the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, a benefit for people with AIDS. The only way I can raise money to fight AIDS is by doing things like that. I can't sing, I can't dance. I told myself, if I don't go, I'm letting down the people I love and support with all my heart. Sometimes I get so angry at my body. Not many people have a medical history like mine. These last couple of years have been hard in other ways. My marriage had come undone, and I lost Shen Sam, who had been my dear friend and publicist. 
so I wasn't ready to face this latest thing. But I'm trying. I sometimes give way to panic, but not to despair. I never think of giving up. I love life, I believe in life, and I'll fight for it. I believe you have to put up your dukes and fight, even if you don't know what you're fighting against. Half of living is dealing with fate, with the unforeseen. Sometimes you just have to wait until the blow hits you, and then do the best you can. I get ill because I live too hard. I give too much, out of a lust for life. I never back away. I relish life and face it dead on. Sometimes it's almost more than I can face. But I try to stay wide open to whatever happens, ready to meet any experience and go forward. Every day, we need to tell someone we love them, touch them, thank them for being. It's so important. The power of love is a gift from God, like the blue in the sky, and the sounds of birds, and the smell of flowers, and the taste of food. It's so easy to forget that life is a gift from God. I've known that ever since that time I died. I went through the tunnel and saw the most wonderful light at the end of it and I longed to be there, but Mike Todd was at the end of the tunnel, and he told me I had to go back and live. And I have lived. If the knife slips while I'm on that operating table tomorrow, and I never wake up in this world again, I'll die knowing I've had an extraordinary life. It's been filled with love, but don't get me wrong, I've still got a lot of living left to do. It's not over. The fat lady has not sung. She was in surgery for her brain tumor, and I remember sitting for hours on the floor of her hospital room waiting for her to come out, and it was scary. A brain tumor is scary. Her children were there. The dog was at Cedars for a while, but I just remember it was long hours, and I, I never wanted to intrude on her family time, but there was, I mean, I just adored her. So I sat there too, waiting for her to come out, and she did. And she came back. Five days later, and I'm alive. When I came to, my feeling was wild joy. I didn't die, I didn't have a stroke. They got the tumor, the meningioma, every bit of it. And I'm pretty sure they left all my marbles. These last few weeks, I've been floating on a cloud of love, and I felt love healing me. Sure enough, the words returned, and my sense of humor too. After the operation, a doctor who was checking my responsiveness showed me his wedding ring. I'm told I said, Hmm, I've had a lot of those. My whole head is swollen, I've got the worst headache in history, and I look like an axe murderer's victim. The scar on my scalp is seven inches long. But I'm very lucky, very grateful. I feel reborn. Shaving Elizabeth's head was necessary for the surgery. She joked in the Life magazine article that now the tabloids would have to eat their words about her having plastic surgery. Aside from the fresh surgery scar, there were no facelift scars to be found. Perhaps that thought is where she got the idea to photograph herself, though not for the reason she joked. She insisted on having beautiful photographs of her taken bald with her scar and very iconic. She was happy to just let the world see her um, with a scar and bald. And it's very pretty pictures, very groundbreaking. And her hair came in white. So that was. She just uh, kind of laid it all out there for the world to see that even the most beautiful woman in the world, there's hiccups to your life. She was photographed by Harry Benson for Life magazine, and she wanted to be photographed that way because there are women that lose their hair from chemo and things like that when they have cancer, and she wanted to show that it's okay. I'm Elizabeth Taylor, but I don't care if you see me this way. And you shouldn't care if people see you that way. It, that's not what matters. What matters is in your heart. And that was for sure a huge thing with Elizabeth. I mean, her mother explained that to her when she was a little girl. She said, you know, you're, I mean, Elizabeth told me this. 
She said, you're a nice looking girl. You have lovely eyes, but it's what's behind the eyes. It's what's in your heart that's going to make you truly beautiful. By the time she recovered from the brain surgery, Elizabeth had triumphed over death more times than a proverbial Egyptian cat, albeit a queen. Of course, she was mortal. The day would come when she was no longer of this earth. Have you ever thought of what you wanted on your tombstone? Here lies Liz. She lived. No, I don't like Liz. I hate that name. Well? Here lies Elizabeth. She hated being called Liz. (laughs) (laughs) But she lived. (laughs) But she would make it into the next century. As the 20th century turned over into the 21st, Elizabeth still had more life to live, more art to create, and more triumphs left up her sleeve. One was her unique version of her life story. Elizabeth endeavored into an autobiography titled My Love Affair with Jewelry. It was an art book in which Elizabeth used her jewelry collection as a device to tell her story, to share her big moments like her marriages to Mike Todd and Richard Burton, and her most precious memories, like when she purchased her first piece of jewelry as a gift for her mother. When it came to the jewelry collection, Tim Mendelson and Elizabeth's editor, Ruth Peltison, were her collaborators. Tim on caring for each jewelry piece and Ruth in finding the words to describe them. In that incredible collection was the story of Elizabeth's heart and soul. So Elizabeth did a jewelry book. It came out in 2002. She worked on it primarily in 2001, and it was called My Love Affair with Jewelry. And it just, at the time, seemed important that Elizabeth do her own book about her jewelry collection. And it's the first and last time somebody's done something like that about their own collection. And it was was on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, it was phenomenally successful. Every day, uh, gearing up for the project was sort of a tsunami of Incredibles. because of the experiences were really unlike anything I'd experienced. And I've worked with a lot of uh, very high profile authors over the years, Um, MacArthur recipients, art critics, uh, couturiers, all names that you would know. But I was smart enough to know there's only one Elizabeth Taylor. So that was really the beginning. And After months of back and forth, finally, we had a team in place and I I brought the team together and we got through the contract stage and I was brought out to L.A. to meet Elizabeth. As I say, I've met a number of high flying people in my life, but every day I would go to Elizabeth's like, Ruth, it's Monday. You're going to meet Elizabeth at two o'clock. Ruth, why don't you come back tomorrow morning at 11? Okay, come back Tuesday at 11. You know. This was a little, got some other things going, what, how's Wednesday at four? Okay, so no one ever said how's never, but they just <laughs> kind of kept getting pushed back. My hair was getting dirtier, and, you know, my manicure was peeling. So finally, uh, the day came, and Tim Mendelson, I was sitting in the living room, and Tim Mendels, Mendelson said, Ruth, let's go upstairs, Elizabeth wants to meet you. I said, great. I'm extremely calm. We go upstairs, and Elizabeth's in, in the bedroom, and she sort of, in a very queenly position in bed. I'm thinking to myself, now, Ruth, you were raised with very good manners. You can do this. Because I suddenly thought, oh my God, this feels different. So Tim says, "Um, Elizabeth, this is Ruth Peltison. And then he goes, Ruth, this is Dame Elizabeth. And I went, oh my God. I mean, I thought to myself, I was not expecting that. And with this, Elizabeth extends her hand palm down, straight out. And I thought, okay, do I curtsy? I did. (laughs) And I took the very tips of her fingers and I went, hello. I was fairly gobsmacked. I thought, okay. And she sat up in bed and she said, so do you want to tell me your idea for the book or shall I tell you mine? And I thought to myself, well, that's really very easy. I said, why don't you begin? And so she did. That was getting to the starting gate of meeting Elizabeth. In my business as an editor, our job is to be behind the curtain. 
we should never pretend that we are on the stage. I think a good editor is invisible. And so I thought, well, it's very, very clear who's in front of the curtain here. And it, it, it was sort of good in a way that she was so larger than life because I wasn't trying to buddy up with her. I wasn't trying to say, aren't we girlfriends? I thought, no, we are both women and we both have brown hair, but that's about it. It was a healthy perspective to keep in mind because the focus was on Elizabeth. It was Elizabeth's story. It wasn't my story. As part of the process in writing the jewelry book, Elizabeth's conversations with Ruth and Tim were recorded as they scoured through the collection for one memory after another from Elizabeth's life. Here's a sampling. I thought that was your mother, the Art Deco bracelet. Uh huh. Did she give that to you while she was still alive? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sweet little bracelet. It is. Here, how about these? These are great. Oh, I have some chandelier ruby, I mean, uh, emerald and diamond chandeliers, three drops. And they come down to my shoulder. They hit my shoulder. Are those the Kaczynski? Yes. Uh-huh. And they were in the window at the Dorchester Hotel when everybody else was going over to check check in at the concierge. These things were flashing laser lights out of one of their display windows. I mean, not literally, but I could see them. I could see the earrings just as clear as could be. And I just walked like in a trance over toward them going, you're mine, you're mine, you're mine. 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 And I asked somebody to take it open the uh, window. And then I got a hold of the people from Kaczynski and haggled with them. Because I don't buy anything for myself without haggling. And I cut a pretty good deal. I'm a pretty good con lady. Yeah, I bet you're, you know, there's no question you're a good businesswoman. Uh, there's no question. And uh, then, let's see, another pair of earrings I got. Wait, no, here, well, here, you did, but this is, I have the Burton Diamond brooch. That goes on the necklace. Burton Diamond, oh, yeah, the Burton Diamond brooch. And when did Richard give that to you? Er, early, early on. You know, a girl needs simple things, too, like just a cluster of diamonds. As rich in detail, story, and beauty as the book is, and as successful as it was set to become, in the fall of 2001, before the book was set to be released, an obstacle in the form of national human tragedy happened to all of us. It was a couple weeks after 9-11, and we'd flown out to Elizabeth's. First time any of us had done anything since, since then. And I was quite nervous about flying. I remember that. All of us are crying on the airplane. And uh, get to Elizabeth's house. And Tim says, Ruth, Elizabeth wants to see you. And I thought, you know, I had my notebook and my recording devices and everything. And Elizabeth was standing at the top of the steps. And I got up there. And she said, Ruth, you know, we've just had this terrible thing happen in this country. And I said, yes, we have. She said... And she looked at me and her eyes just welled up and she said, I just don't think, I mean, even now it makes me curious. She said, I just don't think I can do a book about jewelry at a time like this. And she stood there and we were the same height, which was maybe the only other thing we had in common. (laughs) And we hugged. And as much as I was thinking, oh my God, what are we going to do? Because we had a very big contract and all sorts of commitments, I respected her, her sense of humanity, of humility, of being appropriate, of wanting to make sure that she was understood as being appropriate, meaning that was the real Elizabeth. You don't take 
death for granted or in stride. It is big and awful and terrible. So those were very long lasting and moving experiences. You know, oh God, I wish I was wearing my nightgown and we have to cancel the book. We just can't do anything about jewelry. And so the PS to that was I came back downstairs and it was like 12 o'clock and I looked at the designer and I said, we have to leave. And he said, what do you mean? I said, just come on, get in the car. And he said, where are we going? I said, drive to the Beverly Hills Hotel. We sat outside and I said, we are each getting a vodka because I need to tell you something. The book is canceled. (laughs) But it was at that moment where Elizabeth's humanity was unshakable, period, full stop. Again, my job was to listen, not push. She had other people to do that. My job was to listen. That was an extremely, extremely, extremely important moment. And to be honest, it also puts in perspective all the things I've mentioned about her girlhood, protecting people, looking out for other people. Are people okay? Are they being looked after? Are they being taken care of? Does someone care? Elizabeth always cared. That was a great lesson. That was a great lesson. I'm happy to say that Elizabeth's team was able to persuade her to get back on the jewelry treadmill and we did the book and here we are now, all these years later. This complicated woman was at base, the sort of baseline Elizabeth was an extremely empathic, humanity-oriented person. That was a good lesson. Looking through it, Elizabeth basically says over and over again, this jewelry doesn't belong to me. I'm their temporary custodian because I'm going to pass away one day and they're going to go on. Other people are going to own these. And I just hope that people own them with the same joy and love and sense of fun that I have. Other people would own them. They would pass on as Elizabeth would. Elizabeth Taylor's death would be like all the layers of Elizabeth Taylor's life, an ending that propelled an epic beginning. Death and life all wrapped up in a singular moment. And this new beginning, this final posthumous act from our great actress and humanitarian, our first influencer, it was one she had thoughtfully curated, like the work of art her life had been. And good morning, everyone. For those of you that are joining us on Good Morning America and other programs, we're interrupting it right now because we have a special board here with David Muir on Robin Roberts. And unfortunately, we have just confirmed that Elizabeth Taylor has died. On the next episode of Elizabeth the First. We didn't know she was going to die when she did. She, She had so many scares in her life. We'd really lived through that before, and it came, to me at least, it came as a huge shock. She called me on several occasions to come talk to her about certain things in the hospital. It broke my heart. And, you know, she made me a trustee long before she died. And it was a shock to me. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what a trustee was. And it's not something I had ever thought about anticipated. Things just mobilized very quickly after that. I mean, the fact that she passed away in March of that year and we had a sale in December, to me, is extraordinary. Elizabeth Taylor played a queen on the silver screen and lived like one in her private life. Last night, we told you her famous jewelry collection was going up for auction, but we had no idea how much the buyers would pay. Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. 
Joshua Klebe wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese Tivy. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit elizabethtaylor-aidsfoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon by number one New York Times bestselling author Kate Anderson Brower will be out on December 6th. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.